Good morning, church. I welcome you to worship at Wesley United Methodist Church. My name is Jeff Cullen. I'm a pastor here at Wesley for our youth and for our families, and I'm so honored to be in worship with you this morning. I know it's different in times like this with this pandemic still going on. We do hope to see light at the end of this tunnel, but it is great to know that even when we're not in the sanctuary, we are still together. We are worshiping together even in this moment, and I'm so grateful to God for that. And I want to say thank you to Natalie for always sending out each Friday that email that includes our bulletin that gives us all the information of, of what's going on in the life of our church. I really feel like, Natalie, that's helping keep us connected, and I'm grateful to you for your work. If this is your first time with us or, or you've been a few times and you're not getting that email, I want to invite you to get in touch with Natalie because she would love to include you on that email. You can reach her. You can go to the website and look for her there. Or if you just want to email her, you can do that by going to communications, that's plural, at wesleyumcgreenville.org. She'll be sure and add you to that list. This is Communion Sunday, so communion will be happening directly following this, our 1030 service. So it should be about 1130. It'll be happening down on the office end of the building. So come be a part of worship with us. Uh, excuse me. Come be a part of communion with us. We, it's a really special opportunity where you can come by and receive the grace of God. Let us be in communion with all of the saints of Jesus Christ. Come and be a part of that with us. Now, if you have that candle at home, we call it a community worship candle. You see that we have one here at church. It just helps remind us when it burns during worship, it helps remind us that we, in fact, are together. And it also reminds us that the Holy Spirit is present in the places that we worship, wherever we find ourselves at this time. God is with us, and we are worshiping together. As you light your candle, can you also remember with us that the light shines into the darkness, but darkness does not overcome it. Let's pray together. Wonderful and incredible God, we invite the power of your Holy Spirit into the places that we worship this morning. Stir in us by your power and by your grace. Stir in us that something new and wonderful might happen. Create in us better people that we might love and forgive more than we ever have before. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brock Johnson. I'm the minister of music here at Wesley. It's so great to be with you this morning. Let's sing our opening hymn, hymn number 156, I Love to Tell the Story.
Join me as together we affirm our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. church. My name is Chris Yost and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at Wesley United Methodist Church. It's great to be with you this morning. Uh, as you have prayer concerns, things you want to lift up, I encourage you to make sure and type those in if you're on Facebook, on YouTube. You could also put that in the comment section there. Um, we are joined together by the presence of the Holy Spirit in prayer with and for one another. Uh, today, I wanted to do something just a little bit different. I know we've been in this sermon series where we're examining our own hearts and our motives and uh, um, kind of how we forgive and interact in a world that isn't always as kind and forgiving as perhaps it should be. With that kind of uncomfortable territory that we're journeying in, I wanted to offer you a word in our time of prayer, a word that comes from the Psalms. That's the prayer book or the hymn book of the uh, Old Testament of the Hebrew people. And this one may be very familiar for some of you, and for others, I commend it to you for your further care. I'll be reading as a prayer the 23rd Psalm this morning. I want to give you a few moments. Whatever you've brought before you or brought with you into the presence of God, I invite you to lift up those prayers. And uh, then we're going to pray this and the Lord's Prayer together with prayer. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we gather together in Your presence, we thank You, God, for the many ways that You've seen us through difficult days as of late. We thank You, God, that our faith is not bound up in the trials and tribulations of one generation, but is something that's been passed on to us for several thousand years. And God, in that line of prayer, in that line of secession, we ask that You would empower us to live faithfully, that we would impart to later generations the good news of Jesus Christ. 
In that Spirit, God, we pray these words, these ancient words, we make them our own as You give them to us. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For You are with me. Your rod and Your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of even my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Kiddos, I want to invite you now to gather around for children's time with Miss Leslie. so happy that you're here with us today. You know, we have been talking about uh, Jesus and his love toward us and forgiving others. And today we're going to talk about in Romans, uh, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the people who were in Rome. And he was telling them the things that he knew that they needed to do to be a follower of Jesus. Now, they were things that uh, weren't always going to be easy, but this is what he wanted them to, the ways that he wanted them to follow. So let me show you. Uh, the first one on the top of the cross is love. Now, he wants us to love everyone with all our heart, just like we love Jesus and we share his love. And then we need to be real about who we are. You know, um, we don't need to act like we're better than anyone or smarter than anyone. We need to be friends with everyone. And then also, we need to be respectful. The way we treat people is the way that we would like for them to treat us. So we respect them. And then we're fair with one another. You know, we don't try to get even with one another. If someone has um, done something to you and you don't like it, then it's not nice to do something back to them, is it? We need to be fair with each other. And to be kind, treat each other with kindness. You know, kindness, uh, it goes a long way in how we get along with each other if we just treat each other kindly. And then when we pay attention to others' feelings, we care for them, don't we? 
we show them Jesus' love by caring for them. Now, will these things that uh, Paul said to do to be a follower of Jesus, will they be easy to do? No, they won't be easy to do at all. Because when we do these things, we'll, we won't be thinking of ourselves, but we'll be thinking about the other people. And sometimes that's hard to do. But that's the reason I put all these words on a cross. Because this reminds us that we are to be like Jesus and follow his rules to share his love, to respect people, to be kind, to be fair, to care for one another, and to be me, to treat everyone the way I would want to be treated. Can you say this prayer with me, please? Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for showing us how to follow you. Please help us to always do our best. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Now we come in the time of the service where we present and celebrate our tithes and our offerings. I want to uh, let you know last month when our finance committee met, it was a great celebration to hear that through your generosity, our onward stewardship campaign has paid down our note to $910,000. Friends, that means from the end of December until today, we paid off $55,000 more dollars on our loan that we have to pay off the, uh, the Joe Ramsey end of the building. So thank you for your ongoing generosity. Now, as far as our tithes and our offerings, um, we always could use your help. There are several ways that you can give. You can do so online at wesleyumcgreenville.org. You can uh, click on the donate tab and scroll down. You can send a check to post office box 864 Greenville, Texas 75403. You can also do text to give, and thanks to Miss Natalie Pegg, our communications director, you can give through the Wesley app. I cannot believe I'm going to say it. it's available in the App Store or on Google Play. Isn't that hilarious? But thank you for all of you and your generosity, and thank you for making these things possible. Let's pray. Lord, out of the abundance of our lives, we contribute these tithes and offerings. God, through it, I pray that you would remind us that we're more than our bank accounts. We're more, God, than uh, digits uh, in someone's calculations of GDP. <laughs> we are your children, first and foremost. We're more than our jobs. We're more than anything. But we are your children. And it's in that spirit that we present our tithes and offerings. Amen.
sermon series that we've been going through the last couple of weeks, I'll be reading our scripture again in the midst of the sermon. And uh, if you're just joining us for the first time, uh, I encourage you to go back and start maybe at January 17th if you're online. Uh, and uh, you can kind of get caught up on this. I mean, you're going to be fine joining us today, but there's a whole series that we're in the midst of right now. So I invite you to join with me as we prepare our hearts and minds for the word of the Lord. God, we thank You for meeting us on back porches, in cars, across continents. We thank You, God, for meeting us where we are at. Saints and skeptics and sinners gathered here to see, God, if just maybe You have a refreshing, life-giving Word for us. So Lord, we open our hearts and our minds to You. And we ask, God, that You would unlock them that You would show us Your way. God, I do pray that You hide me behind the cross and allow Your living water to flow out of this earthen vessel. Amen. 
So folks, you know, uh, this series is perhaps more necessary now than it was even when we started it. Why is it so necessary? Now, as we've said, we cannot possibly hope to affect God's grace, God's peace everywhere throughout the world. That's just not our task. You and I are not omnipresent people. But we are called to share the good news of Jesus Christ from this heart of Hunt County. And from here, we are so fortunate to get to have friends that are in Mexico and Canada and North Dakota and Washington State. We're privileged to be from this place able to cast the light, that ripple of God's healing love out into a world that right now probably needs it. We do this because when the people of God see things that are contrary to the kingdom of God, we don't hide our light, do we? You remember the old, uh, the old uh, children's song, we don't hide our lights under the bushel basket, do we? No, we let it shine. When we see talk of hatred, when we see people with villain, vilified looks on their face, when we see people loaded with vindictiveness, such things on the rise are the bell that the church is invited to answer. Do we shine brighter in the darkness or do we let the darkness have its way? We're doing this because friends, there are forks in the road that are right in front of us. There are forks in the road where some of them will, some of these, these, these paths will lead us to God's best for you, for me, for our community, for our nation, and even for this world. And there are other forks in the road that would lead us to humanity's worst. Some people even allegedly in the name of God are trying to spur us to go down roads which by their fruit show us they are not from God. After all, the fruit of God's work is joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When people advocate for violence and hatred and destruction, folks, we must be warned and we must heed the warning that this is not the way that leads to the life that God would have for us. A little over a week ago, the world was reminded on Holocaust Remembrance Day how easily we can forget how easy it is to dismiss the evil works as they happened among humanity in their own day. The Auschwitz Museum had sent out a reminder to us, quote, at Auschwitz, we see the end of a long process. It's important to remember that the Holocaust did not start from gas chambers and murder. The hatred slowly developed from ideas words, stereotypes, and prejudice through legal exclusion, escalating violence, and dehumanization. That last part's what gets me. It's the one I've heard the most recently. That dehumanizing of other people. People made in the image of God referred to as animals. Calling people made in the image of God names that we wouldn't say in front of our moms, much less our grandparents. And God forbid our children look back at what has been said in this era. We have stepped down the wrong path. The good news is it is never too late. And the light of the Holy Spirit will guide us and will show us the way. An old acquaintance had asked me in reference to ways of violence and how we wipe away evil from the world. He, he went through and he said, didn't God still call us to wipe out our enemies like in the Old Testament? Doesn't God still do this? And I responded, isn't it funny how often God's enemies, I'm air quoting that, look a lot more like people we treat as enemies. Second of all, and perhaps most importantly, Friends, we live in the New Testament experience of the same God. You see, we live on the other side of the cross 
where violence no longer gets the last word. And see, in God's kingdom, it is resurrection which defines who we are. The teaching, the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension to heaven determines who we are and how we conduct ourselves. Anything that doesn't pass the muster of Jesus is just a part of the Old Testament. It's part of the Old Covenant. It is a part of our story, but not necessarily one that should be repeated. When we have tendencies towards violence, friends, we got to go back and see what Jesus said about such things. Luke chapter 6, verses 20 through 49 is perhaps the most concise summary of what that means for us. It's at least a great place to start. Now, we have heard claims from people about what God told them in the last couple of months, and yet those things did not come to pass. So are we to go through and that believe, believe that according to them that God didn't tell them the right story? Of course not. Those who are calling for violence are the hucksters of our day and do not speak for the Lord God. So friends, that's why we continue this sermon series. Apparently the message is not done in us. And I guarantee you the message is not done being spoken through us. So today I want to read to you from the book of Romans, the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. And I'm going to read from the Common English Bible uh, this morning. Love should be shown without pretending. Hate evil and hold on to what is good. Love each other like the members of your family. Be the best at showing honor to each other. Don't hesitate to be enthusiastic. Be on fire in the Spirit as you serve the Lord. Be happy in your hope. Stand your ground when you're in trouble. And devote yourselves in prayer. Contribute to the needs of God's people and welcome strangers into your home. Bless people who harass you. Bless and do not curse them. Be happy with those who are happy. Cry with those who are crying. Consider everyone as equal and don't think that you're better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people no matter their status. Don't think that you're so smart. Don't pay back anyone for their evil actions with evil actions, but show respect for what everyone else believes is good. If possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. Don't try to get revenge for yourselves. Dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. It is written, as it is written, revenge belongs to me. I will repay it back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. By doing this, you will pile burning coals of fire upon their head. Don't be defeated by evil, but defeat evil with good. Pretty much to go through and just email this to you. And if you'll live that, we're done. The whole sermon series is over. But friends in here, I think we want to spend just a few more minutes. Now in this passage, I always want to be clear when we're reading the Texan Gospel and the you and me Gospel. This is one of those mixes. This is the you, y'all version of things. It's this banter back and forth that calls forth your actions as an individual, my actions as an individual, as we relate to the world around us. How do you and I relate as we in this world? What are we to do when we feel wrong? I've, I've talked with several of you on the phone. We've done emails. Uh, we've met. I understand that you feel wrong. There are people in times in society where things that uh, uh, happen don't make much sense from our perspective. I'll tell you, what do we do when we feel wrong, right? Do we just go through and say, oh, it's okay? Sometimes. Do we go through and hold it over someone's head? Do we pursue them and make sure they pay for it? Could be. I want us to ask a question for a moment. 
Are there times in society where we too want to make sure that, well, there's a measure of justice that is paid out? Let me, let me say just a little bit more here for a minute. If we go through and allow some things to not go called out, not held to account, are we then perpetuating that behavior in the world around us? Or do we just go through and always pretend that everything is okay when it's not? Let me give you an example. As a child, I recall how people on a regular basis seem to be getting killed with drunk drivers. You see, back then you could be well beyond drunk and drive behind the wheel, and if something happened, I remember a person in our community in Pottsboro, Texas, who had killed somebody, and you know what the town said? Well, he's just a good old boy. He didn't mean anything by that. And guess what? More and more people drank. More and more and more people drove. Why? Just It was just an accident. Friends, it took time and it took things like DUIs, which I know people out there have had, right? It's, caught, it's taken things like laws and eventually where a person gets held accountable when they murder someone behind the wheel, we all know you're not going to get away with that. And over time, that sense of justice begins to be had. And it's not that most families want somebody to pay a price. They don't want anybody else to pay the price that they've already paid. You see, there's times when we all call for justice. Don't even get me started when we hear about weak and vulnerable people, perhaps even children being abused by adults. We don't let them get away with a pinky promise that everything's going to be okay, do we? You're not going to beat those children and you're not going to abuse them. Not on our watch, right? So there are times where as society, there are calls to a greater form of justice. One of the hallmarks though of biblical justice is it's not something that's left up to the passions of a moment. It's not something that's left up to an individual in and of themselves. But rather, normally it's a corporate act. It's something that by the laws of the people, by the laws of the land, certainly by the laws of God, that we decide that justice is offered out. But more often than not, this sense of carrying the burdens of yesterday's injustices as something that me and you personally have to carry? Friends, I'll tell you, we can look at the news and we can look around at what people are saying and realize it is too big a burden for you and I to carry. How do we act as individuals in our community? How do you and I interact when we do carry our own resentments? When we do feel like we have been wronged and those things do weigh us down. You remember a couple weeks ago we were talking about that loaded pockets, right? Those stones that we carry ready to cast at someone else. Friends, listen to this. Bless those who harass you. Bless and do not curse them. Think about it this way. Who's the most despised person in your life? Maybe personally. Hopefully not a neighbor. Hopefully not a family member. Maybe it's a politician. Whoever you just thought of, the most despised person in your life should be the person you have prayed for the most throughout the last week. Right? Bless those who curse you. Bless and do not curse them is the way the New Revised Standard Version reads. Is that person the most prayed for person in your life? The text tells us don't pay back anyone for their evil actions with evil actions, but show respect for what everyone else believes it is good. Friends, only in mathematics class does one negative times another negative equal a positive. And the rest of life, harm begets harm, begets harm, begets harm. The only way we break the cycle of evil and vengeance is when we stop participating. It will not start with them. I hate to be the one to tell you, if you've never learned that yet, welcome to the club. Evil stops when it stops right here. 
Verse 18 and 19 remind us that vengeance is a poison no human being is capable of holding. Kind of like a little tiny, tiny speck of something like plutonium. Did you know one microgram of plutonium is enough to kill you? Friends, I want you to think about vengeance as that kind of a poison. When you think you're going to get somebody back, that somehow you're going to fix the coals and the arguments that someone might have got up on you before, Friends, always trying to get someone back is like carrying this little pebble that's poisonous to us all. Where does it end? Leave it to God. As a matter of fact, one of the commentaries I was reading on this kind of talks about a, a, a retribution or, or vengeance or even revenge, if you will. And it talked about having three major notions in the early church. And Paul certainly has uh, two in mind. The first one was that I'm going to get my own vengeance, right? I'm going to get them back. If you have any doubt, that's just a big no. All right, moving on to the other two. The second one was is God, as the causal agent, the one who is causing retribution or causing punishment? This one, Paul probably would not be talking about as much. Instead, he's talking about the human being paying over that sense of I want to get revenge. And he's saying, leave it to God. Leave it to the timing of God. Leave it to that place because you cannot handle it. But the third one, the third part is something I think people picked up on throughout the world if they've grown up in the Christian world or not. There seems to be this long arc of history that always bends towards justice. At some point in the grand design of life, those who have taken end up not being able to take anymore. Being called to account. Let me ask you a question. Uh, last week I asked you to keep a list of your angers, your, your rages, the things that were taking you outside of your love center with God. Uh, did you do that? Did you keep that list? I hope you brought it with you this morning. If not, I don't want to provoke too much in you here, but kind of think about some of those things, right? The angers, the hatreds, the circumstances that left you wound up outside of who you are and who you're called to be. I need you to take a look at that list for just a moment. What did you write down? Which ones or which things involved other people? Which ones were internal to you? In other words, you may even put a little code down so no one else saw what you were wrestling with. Which one were sins that were inside of you though that interacted with someone else? The hardest ones ever are the ones where someone else has done us wrong and you could objectively show how they did it wrong, and yet you still have anger for that person. Now I want to invite you to do something. Get you a little pen or pencil. And I want you to look at anything on there that you hope God holds against you on Judgment Day. So go ahead, get your pen. Yeah. And anything that you really hope that you have to give an account for to speak to on Judgment Day, go ahead and put a circle. Go ahead and circle that on your page for just a minute. Oh, I'll wait. I'll wait. Are you done? Yeah, I didn't circle anything either, so let's keep moving on. All right. Because after all, like we prayed earlier, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, right? I'm sure I have plenty to speak for when I get there. I don't need to add this list to it. Can I get an amen, right? Now, I do want to offer you something else. How about we put a line through the things that we hope God takes away out of our lives? Maybe put a line through the things that we might be struggling with and we're going to need a lot of help with, but God, we think, is faithful. How about we strike? Maybe some of these things we just have to completely mark them out because we just, it's plutonium. We got to get rid of it. Just a little bit will kill all of us. And we just. You think just maybe? 
that the things that you hope you're forgiven of and their better selves, somebody else might be hoping they're forgiven too. Friends, the world around us is not going to take the initiative on this. As a matter of fact, the hardest part in all of this is God calls you and I to take the initiative to be the peacemakers, to be the ones who sow seeds of forgiveness in the world around us. And you know what's funny? You, me, by ourselves, we're not capable. I hate to tell you that you aren't, you aren't capable either. But that's why we have grace, friends. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we know God is at work inside of our lives, all these things that we see the Apostle Paul taking shape just begin to happen. It's something that brings forth the fruit of the Spirit out of our lives. It's not something we simply aspire to. Can you imagine how cruel it would be of God to call us to be these kind of people and then not equip us to live it out? I've been around the sun just enough times now to start figuring out that God is not only willing, God is able. And God will bring these things to pass. Don't pay back evil for evil. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. And by doing this, you will pile burning coals of fire on his head. I'm going to end with this. I, I, I always laugh because I'm like, Dad, burn it, Paul. Didn't he know that metaphor would not help in our day and age? Sometimes people say, kill him with kindness, and they think this is what it means. And friends, what Paul is talking about, coals are purifying elements. Think back to the book of Isaiah when Isaiah is standing in the presence of God and he says, who am I, God? I have unclean lips. And the uh, angel of the Lord grabs a coal and touches his lips. You see, coal fire is a purifying act biblically. This is not a punishment upon them. But it's by your good acts, you purify them. You give that over to them. Don't be defeated by evil, but we overcome evil with good. God is able. Are you willing to let Him? Let's pray. Lord, we confess that far too often we carry these grudges deep inside. Anger corrodes. That dead-end roads of resentment drive us to our own versions of insanity. God, help us to know the embrace of Your love for us. That we may finally let go of the things which hold us back. Those things of old. Instead, God, help us to be fully forgiven and turn fully forgive. Let Your Word wash upon us like the renewing waters of remembering our baptism that Your love may wash over us and give within us a heart for love alone. No longer bound up in meaningless scorecards of vengeance and one-upmanship, but free to give as we have freely received. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Folks, thank you for spending this time with us. I think we're going to have it one more week in this series next week. Um, we'll see how it goes. We may be two more. This is the most unplanned series I've ever had. By the way, we are working on Ash Wednesday services. That's in a week and a half. I know some of you are wondering, how are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? The answer is yes, we are going to do it. And no, we don't know how. <laughs> but we are getting a good clue. So... Anyway, make plans for that. Uh, Wednesday week, we'll be having Ash Wednesday. Anyway, friends, wherever you're at, trust God to do this good and new thing in your life. Go forward in the strong name of God the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.